Episode four of The Acolyte is now streaming on Disney Plus, and uh, we are now graced with one of the shortest episodes yet. Now, I say it's one of the shortest, but it could have been shorter because <laughs> barely anything happened in this episode. Guys, let's take a look at the Rotten Tomatoes score. The critic score is down from a 95% all the way down to an 83%, which is still way too high. Somebody's getting paid off. Somebody's doing some laundry, money laundering, that is, right into the pockets of the critics, but not the audience. We can't be bought out, guys. There's a 14% average audience score down from 18% just weeks ago, so <laughs> we might be reaching single digits here soon on The Acolyte. Now, please go leave an honest shitty review because this show is honestly shitty uh now guys we're gonna get right into the episode and break this week's acolyte star wars disney star wars down scene by scene so without further ado let's do this the episode begins on the beautiful planet of kofar now i should say go far go far far away from this Disney Star Wars franchise at this point. <clears throat> Shitty jokes aside, we open on the Wookiee Kalmaka. We see him enter his makeshift home with these strange sketches on the wall. They're eerily similar to the shapes of the tattoos on the witches' faces. Does this mean anything? Probably not, but I hope so, because I just I want something to mean something in this show. So we're, we're crossing our fingers, and we're hoping for the best. Anyways, at this point, I'm more interested in this delicious Wookiee stir-fry, but again, the camera focuses on the drawings. Show me the stir-fry, please. I'm hungry. We then cut right to Coruscant, where Chad Beard, Ginger Jedi Tormund... Is this guy Kel Kestis' his dad? I don't know. Anyways, he's training younglings in the most Disney Channel way possible. I swear, every time they make a training scene in Disney Star Wars, it gets worse and worse. I mean, first we had Ahsoka... <laughs> which is all right. Now we have this. This is just an abomination. Okay, I want to see some action. Seriously, I wish we got to see Daphne Keen actually sparring with another Padawan as she was great with the choreography in Logan. I mean, wasted potential at its finest. Keep each movement tight, yet subtle. Yeah, um, Chad Beard, I would say the same thing to the writers with these episodes, but we're far past any subtlety in this show, okay? That's far gone. Diminish areas of vulnerability. <sighs> How can they learn vulnerability when they are literally fighting the air, okay? I want to see some action. Jesus, Disney, goddamn. Chad Beard then goes on further saying this. Maximize your defenses without need to strike. All they do is literally strike the air. What is this lesson? I feel like, ah, uh, I can't help but think this scene was literally shot just to make us remember Padawan training as a thing in Star Wars and to uh, bolster the trailers with some member berries because this has no impact on the story and it just comes off corny as f I'm sorry. It's just true. That's what it is. Member training? Member Padawans? Yeah, I remember. We then see Osha watching the Padawans and Daphne, sorry, Jackie addresses her after the training. I came to say goodbye. You're not staying? Shamefully, I felt she was addressing me in the audience, and sadly, I am staying for you guys. I'm staying for you guys. I've done what I needed to do. I figured you'd stay until we apprehended her. I mean, you must be curious after all this time. Honestly, yes, I am curious. I'm curious in the same way, uh... <laughs> I'm curious in the same way that I'm curious to see how an imminent train wreck will play out. So, <laughs> again, here we are. Osha then goes on to say that... Someone must find me before she does any more harm, but it's not me. Oh, really? Is is this not the same exact f***ing character from episode two who was literally begging to confront her sister? I will confront her. No. You scared now? You, you change mind? You want to go eat some Wookiee goddamn stir-fry? Me too, all right? I don't know. I just, I can't. I just can't either, my friend. But again, here we are. Here we are. Jackie then asks May if she's going to say goodbye to Soul, and she says this. I've caused him enough trouble. Okay, well, here, let's break this down. Would it not be more trouble for Soul if one of his most important pieces in this very urgent Jedi murder investigation suddenly goes missing without his knowledge? Wouldn't that be more trouble? Also, would he not feel some sort of emotional betrayal for this as well? After he's cared for you uh, most of his life. Seems like a nice guy. Why don't you just go say goodbye, you little witch? You little witch! Anyways, moving forward. 
we get nothing more out of this conversation, really. And thank God, because I'm dead bored already. We got to move this shit forward. This is probably the most boring episode yet, where basically almost nothing happens. But we're going to cover that nothing right now. Let's let's go. We then cut back to Kofor, the Wookiee's planet, as we see a ship land. And it's revealed to be May and Professor Snape Jr., the guy who made the potions, you know, the potential Sith Lord. Anyways, they're preparing for a journey through the forest to find the Jedi boy Chewbacca. Sorry, Kelnaka. They have these trash can looking luggage containers. And my question is, why did they need to drag these all the way off the ship to then just unload them into their bags? Could we not, you know, keep the super heavy containers on the ship and unload the stuff into the luggage bags inside the ship? Well, I, nothing makes sense in this show if you think about it beyond the surface. It's hilarious. <sighs> what is this guy carrying around in there? Perhaps uh, maybe the Smilo Ren Walmart costume? Who knows? Time will time will tell. And we've got like not that much time left in this episode. It's like 20, 25 minutes or something. Uh, now, Snape Jr. tells May, So far is massively uncharted. I know bounty hunters won't set foot in these forests. And he also mentions how bounty hunters won't even set foot in these forests. I mean, why would they? The planet seems to lack almost any form of civilized life forms from what we've been shown. It's like, where's the budget? Put some life on this planet. CGI in a village here and there. Hire some extras to walk around. I don't know. There's like nothing on this planet. It's like dead. Doesn't make any sense. Now, Snape Jr. mentions how he's been here before to find the Wookiee. Oh, but you have. Yes. I have to find the Wookiee, and it was hard. I know. It was also hard for me to find the motivation to watch the episode twice to make this review, but again, here we are. Here we are. <sighs> we then get this shot of the main forest, and honestly, it looks kind of cool. I just wish it wasn't wasted in such a shit show like this. May then asks Snape Jr. why he went into the forest in the first place, and he replies, I risked my life to help you. Apparently, he has a hard-on for May because we get zero motivation for why he would ever be helping her. Uh, maybe he owes the master a favor, or maybe he is the master in disguise. Not to be confused with uh, the master of disguise. Not exactly, but am I not turtly enough for the turtle club? Anyways, we then get ominous foreshadowing, as Snape says. You know, your sister being alive doesn't change anything. You need to kill the Wookiee. Um, oh boy, guys, hold on to your seats because, uh, <laughs> this little detail is literally going to change everything later on in this episode. Snape then says she needs to kill the Wookiee. She made a deal. And May says, there's three hours of sunlight left. Let's get going. And again, I find my mind wandering to the meta of this show. As I think to myself, there's four more episodes of this show left. Let's please move the f forward. Get your ass in that forest. Anyways, and the title card. Boom. And, oh, f*** me, we get an ad for HPV prevention, and I shit you f***ing not, this ad played two times in a row, back to back, followed by a Zyrtec allergy prevention advertisement, and an Applebee's ad, all in one commercial break. And I'm wondering who the f*** this show is even made for, if these are the ads being shown. I think I'll take Zyrtec, though, because I'm quite allergic to bullshit, and this Disney Plus Star Wars fan fiction is absolutely full of it at this point. <sighs> And we're about to get even more bullshit. So hold on to your half-priced appetizers, my friends. Let's keep going. After the title card, we get the most canon-breaking frame in the series to date, as we see the one and only Jedi Kiari Mundi being shown on screen many years before he was even supposed to be born, I believe. Uh, now, if you look it up, they might be changing the canon actively as we speak on Wikipedia and other websites just to match the episode. So I guess it's Leslie Headland's world, and we're just shitting in it, living in it. I don't know. Is that a good joke? Leave it in, Jarvis. I don't know. <sighs> now, this is outrageous, not only for that reason, but for reasons following this as the scene plays out. Anyways, we move forward in this Jedi Council style scene as Jedi imposter Kiati Mundi gets woman-splained about May as this woman says, She is fast, but weak. Her emotions guide her every choice in combat. Yet there is skill there. She's fast, but weak. Um, is she weak? All we've ever seen her do is be able to fight off and kill Jedi, or at least escape unscathed with her life. How, how is she weak? What is that? How, how do you know she's weak? We don't see that. You just tell us that. Now, Walmart Kiati Mundi says there is skill there. And Soul chimes in saying, Someone has trained her. Okay, cool. She's skilled. We already know that. Someone trained her. We already know that. No shit. Sherlock, thanks for the 69th piece of blatantly obvious exposition here. We really needed that one. 
We really needed it. She doesn't know her master's identity. Uh, she doesn't know her master's identity, they say. Uh, yes, we know all of this from previous episodes. I swear this show is 50% repeated expositional dialogue, and it's an absolute waste of time. An apprentice who doesn't know their master. It's absurd. Finally, someone says what I agree with. It's absurd. Oh, wait, he's actually in the show? An unborn Jedi Ki Adi Mundi is actually in the f***ing show. What the? All right. Well, <clears throat> anyways, generic Jedi lady then asks if it's a splinter order. And the other Jedi says, if it's a splinter order, we would know. Uh, you guys have been absolutely f clueless so far. So why the f*** would these people being in a splinter order make it any goddamn easier for you idiots to know exactly who they are? Now, I'm not sure what splinter order means. They don't explain it. Splinter order of the Sith, splinter order of the Jedi, splinter order of 69 shots of tequila to keep me going through this shit. I don't know, man. Every time someone opens their mouth, this show gets dumber and the Rotten Tomato score goes down. This girl could become a major threat. Bruh. She already killed two Jedi. And she killed two Jedi Masters. She literally is the only major threat in this universe right now for you guys that we see in this show. She is the major threat. Get It's four episodes in. She's killing Jedi. She is a threat. What the? F <sighs> we then get Professor Jedi Shrek. Give us a PowerPoint recap of all the dead Jedi just in case we fell asleep during the previous episodes. Or perhaps you turned them off after back-to-back -back ads for HPV prevention and Applebee's half-priced appetizers. Either way, I wouldn't blame you. I'd probably be on my way to Applebee's by now as well. Anyway, Soul goes on to drop further repetitive exposition dialogues as he explains that May targeted these three Je Four. My bad. Sorry. Four. Four Jedi, uh, the four Jedi stationed on her home planet when she was a child. Again, why are we wasting so much time on shit we basically already knew? Like, that's, that's almost going to be like a quarter of this episode is just repeating things we already know. How odd. Yes, Lady Shrek, you're finally getting it. How odd indeed that these writers were even hired in the first place. <laughs> Okay, Shrek then goes on to say that May turns up all these years after being trained by one of our own. Um, she knows this because... You think a Jedi taught her? Even a hologram can tell me that. Even a hologram can tell me that? I uh, Hold the phone. Your evidence that a Jedi trained her is that you saw a hologram. Or you saw her fight a couple times? Is there seriously no one else in the entire galaxy that can fight and do judo chops? Like, the galaxy must be a really small place, my guy. Uh, my girl. Now, Walmart Jedi Kiati Mundi finally says something smart, probably the smartest thing in the entire show, as he utters the words, We must alert the High Council. But the show only has a $180 million budget, and these group of Jedi are dumb as f***. So, Lady Shrek says, The High Council would be obliged to inform the Senate. A scandal like this would inspire fear and mistrust. Well... Actually, Lady Shrek, I think the High Council and the Senate finding out that some lower-level Jedi are able to blatantly lie and cover up the murders of several Jedi would be a far greater risk to both your individual and holistic reputation as Jedi, would it not? Would it not? Basically, everyone in this room is completely if either the High Council or the Senate discovers this great big fib, you absolute dumbass. Also, what's going to happen to sad boy Kiati Mundi here when this shitstorm eventually makes its way into the public eye? Uh, how does he make it through the events of this show and still ascend to the High Council by the time of the prequels? Or does that even matter anymore? Are we just shitting on the grave of George Lucas' Star Wars? I guess we are. But if you can't look and see the Anakin blowing up the Death Star... I want you to get out of this office right now. Dad, no way. You brought no it on way. Your, you brought it on yourself. I don't want you here. Oh, God, kill me. I crush you like a bug. <laughs> It's the <laughs> rest in peace rest in piss god damn it uh, i think he must have a storyline where he becomes the rat in this rebellious group of jedi scum or else i fear his character has been completely and utterly assassinated by leslie and the chuckle f writers room at this point i swear to god <sighs> this show's so bad it made me say the word chuckle f i swear to god man now jedi lady shrek tells woman splinter that she's now in charge of capturing may as she figuratively chops the balls off of Master Squid Game here, and the scene ends, but not before Soul makes his point to Lady Shrek. And uh, she says this. Master Barestra, please. Why didn't you tell me about this? Okay, she must be taking shots of Bunta Juice, because Soul literally told you all of this. I did, as soon as I knew. Yeah, Soul. Yeah, as soon as he knew, he told you. Why didn't you tell me there was a chance this poor girl survived? 
If I thought there was, of course I would have. He's done everything he literally can, and he watched May die. He literally watched May die in an endless pit of flames and fire. No one could have survived that. But oh shit. Uh, I hate to break it to you, Master Squid Game, but actually, um, <laughs> this is indeed Disney Star Wars. And oh boy, do we know a guy who can survive a fall like that. Somehow Palpatine returned. <laughs> to be sure. Okay, fuck the glasses. I don't know what that was. Ugh. Somehow Palpatine returned. Somehow May returned. This look from Kiati Mundi says me and him are on the same exact page. God damn it. How do these motherfuckers keep surviving these goddamn falls? The power of May. They then talk about how, again, May is an apprentice and must have a master. I fear May is only a small part of her master's larger plan. Oh, we get it. She must have a master. She must have been trained. Blah, 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 blah. Move the fuck into that forest and go find that goddamn Wookiee. Please. Sol then completely 4D chess moves Shrek here as she says this. Your personal connection with her and her sister is not a benefit here. But Sol then hits her back immediately saying, She will not surrender without getting something in return. Which then provokes Lady Shrek to ask Sol, Do we have something she wants? And of course, the only carrot worth dangling in front of May is indeed her sister, Osha, perhaps her last tie to her good nature and her empathy and humanity. A piece of the puzzle which requires Soul to have a personal connection to the sisters. Your personal connection with her and her sister is not a benefit here. <sighs> so in the end, Lady Shrek just comes off as a complete waste of space. Maybe she is the Sith Lord. Maybe she's trying to uh, cause cause trouble, cause conflict, cause strife in this uh, in this mission. Could be her. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't want it to be. I don't want her to get any more screen time. So please no, please God no. Uh, we then cut to more green shit as we see May and Snape on Kofar again, making their way to find <laughs> boy Wookiee Jedi. Snape then asks an interesting question. You engage unarmed, but can you use their saber if you disarm them? Uh, she can just force pull a saber and chop them in half then. I have, <laughs> seems like a very easy task if you simply catch a distracted Jedi off guard. Like perhaps a really hungry Jedi, perhaps a Wookiee stir fry Jedi. But I, I won't spoil anything yet. The Wookiee dies. Uh, anyway, Snape then accused May of failing at her attempts so far. I'm just curious how you're going to do it this time. You, you failed so much. So did the show. The show failed so much. And May replies, I didn't fail. I killed Indara and I killed Torben. Yes, May, but killing them is not passing the test, my guy. You actual dumb c I swear to God, nothing makes sense to anyone in this show. Anything they say, just... Uh, uh, it's like someone saying you failed a test, like, a, like an exam, and you're like, yeah, uh, well, no. I didn't fail. I answered every question. Well, that's not how you pass a test. Just because you answered a question doesn't mean you pass. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Snape then says you have to kill a Wookiee without a weapon, but wouldn't disarming them and killing them with a saber be the exact opposite? Like, for sure. I'm so confused and nothing makes sense. Again, just look at those pretty trees and lightsabers and question nothing, you absolute room temperature IQ plebs. Jesus, let's move forward. They both talk about never seeing the actual face of the master and Walmart Snape says the most obvious line in the galaxy. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, unprovoked, May says this. I can't believe my sister shed ice gum. Huh? What, what made you randomly say that? I don't know. Snape then tells May that Osha was once fond of one of the Jedi Masters. Uh, what was his name again? Soul. Ah, sorry. Yes, Master Squid Game. Anyways, May takes this information in as she gives a conflicted look at uh, Walmart Snape here, and we move forward. Anyways, let's get going. Yes, please, for Jabba's goddamn sake, my guy, let's get going. Let's get going. We're almost halfway through the episode and barely anything has happened. We then cut to Osha back on Coruscant as she holds her new piece of overpriced Disney Star Wars merch. Sol confronts Osha and she seems surprisingly eager to perhaps again rejoin her master despite telling Jackie in the previous scene that she's over all this shit. You want me to rejoin the Jedi? Well, not officially. Yeah, all of a sudden you want to rejoin the Jedi? Like, she seems super eager here, even though she was super eager to leave and she didn't give a shit before. I don't know. 
People just change their mind instantly uh, behind the scenes in this show all the time. Doesn't really make sense. Doesn't matter. All right. <sighs> Sol then guilt trips Osha into coming on the mission, and uh, Osha agrees begrudgingly as she mentions she wants to cosplay as a Jedi. Fine. But I'm not wearing that civilian robe. Am I missing something, uh, or did they ever bring up these civilian robes before? Is this a brand new thing? Please let me know in the comments. I'm not sure. I think this show gives me uh, brain damage, and I can't remember anything from the previous weeks. But uh, that's fine. That's fine. I can just watch my videos again. Anyways, we cut to the Jedi ship as Osha is now wearing a Star Wars hoodie she found on Amazon Prime. Seriously, I kind of want that hoodie. Can you, can you send me one of those, Disney? I know I'm on your payroll. I know I'm shilling for your show, clearly. Now, Yord talks about how they stationed the Wookiee on Kofar, but no one has heard from him in over a year. What must he be doing there? Did he get lost in the chalk? Lost in the sauce? I mean, he does have sauce and chalk. Anyways... I want to find out what those drawings are. I really do. I hope it's just not one of those cool shots that we see that never never makes sense. Hopefully we find out because I don't even care. <laughs> now, hold the phone. Is that Plo Koon? No, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> they already shit on Kiai Mooney. Please, God, no. Let it be someone else. Let it be someone else. <laughs> oh, okay, anyways, the Pip Droid and Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend here have a smelling contest, and we learn that this is our newest addition to the Jedi team. The Tracker. Basil. Ah, yes. Sorry. Basil. This is Basil. The sniveling, sniffing. I never like it when there's like super animalistic Jedi. I, I, I don't know. I like them to be a, a little more human-esque, but whatever. Now, in classic condescending Yord fashion, he then addresses Osha and the group as he asks, Any questions, civilian? No. May then patronizes him, saying this. No. Very comprehensive briefing, Yord. And we move on to the Wookiee planet after a nearly pointless scene. Now, I say nearly pointless because uh, we did learn about the little tracker guy, kind of. But uh, we could have had all this dialogue take place during the upcoming hunt through the forest, including the introduction to the tracker. But no, we need to spend $23 million turning six minutes of story into 28 minutes while still leaving room in the budget for Leslie Headland's closet of designer suits. But I guess I digress. Let's, let's move on, shall we? We finally arrive at the Wookiee planet, and it took us 13 minutes of the episode to basically be at the beginning of the actual important story details of the episode. Seriously, like, almost nothing has happened besides repeated exposition so far, and we met Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend. Great. They land and immediately find a video game NPC checkpoint, a guy sitting in a chair in the middle of nowhere on a seemingly uninhabited, uncivilized planet because there was only a measly $180 million in the budget. They couldn't fill out this world any further. They couldn't. It just wasn't possible. Seriously, he's got like this trading outpost thing here, but like who the hell is even out here in the first place? And what would they even be trading? I, we don't see any signs of life here. Just like the show, just like the writing in this show. No signs of life. This universe makes zero sense. Yord then tells Osha, You're gonna need to hand that blaster over. Well, it's, it's mine now. Uh, didn't you guys seriously let her have this gun the whole entire time during the previous missions? What changed now? It seems, again, like the writers just need more contrived conflict to keep things interesting and further characterize Yord as an ignorant dumbass that we can laugh at. But uh, I promise you, he is not the one responsible for the laughter. It's the shitty writing. I'm sorry, it's not the character. Ugh. Jackie then comes back from the NPC trading outpost and she says something that we would have never suspected. The locals say he ventured off into the forest and never came back. Oh really? The planet made entirely of forest is where Kalnaka went. He went into the forest on the forest planet. Like, come on, can we just get into the forest already? I swear to God. We then get a pretty cool shot of the actual forest. And uh, I don't know, it is cool, but it's still, this is the only shot in the show that I felt really did look heavily CGI'd. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in terms of landscape shots. So I'm trying to give it a pass, but I can't. So there's something kind of off with it. It's like they used the fog to hide the fact that this was the volume. You see how that there's that layer of fog on the bottom middle of the screen? That's kind of hiding the point Point where the volume, the, uh, the the LED screen, the green screen of sorts, if you will, is is taking place, and they're on a sound stage here. Clearly, otherwise they wouldn't have that layer of that weird layer of fog. We then get yet another repeated line of expository dialogue as Soul says this: "Kalaka is in there." So Jackie just said he was in there. The locals say he ventured off into the forest and never came back. Then Soul points at the forest and says he's in there. Kalaka is in there. We get it. He's in there. Now get the f 
in there. Osha then asks the very important question, how do we find him? And Yor reveals that we do have a tracker. Remember uh, Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend? Yeah, that guy. Anyways, he gets a big old whiff of Kelnaka's underwear. And uh, he's able to find him from across the goddamn galaxy at that point. Because, oh boy, that's some spicy stir fry he's cooking up in that, <laughs> in that little home of his. So we're going we're gonna to find Kelnaka in no time. We then get the world's shittiest homage to Lord of the Rings. As our heroes or Jedi, they're not supposed to be heroes, actually, our scum of the universe travel single file here on this hill. Now, both the shot and the characters are both extremely incompetent compared to Lord of the Rings. So it's kind of just laughable. It's almost like an SNL sketch of what uh, Jedi Lord of the Rings mashup would look like. It just comes off as like just the stupidest thing I've ever seen in the show. This might be the stupidest single shot in the show so far. The characters are just not selling me on this Lord of the Rings adventure type vibe. They're just, we just don't give a shit. It's not earned, you know? Yord talks about how he's like the only one in the Jedi Order that can speak to Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend as he learned the, uh, their language instead of another language. And uh, May then asks him this. Although most Padawans want to learn Shariwok, I took it upon myself to learn a language a little more nuanced. Okay, well, if you're upset I'm on this mission, join the club. All he said was, well, I actually learned a language uh, that nobody else knows. He wasn't talking about you, you dumb shit, Ojida. Like, what? <clears throat> I don't know at this point anymore. I'm like, I'm losing my sanity. The writers just think they're so clever writing this little conflict these little dialogue pieces that are supposed to uh, drive conflict and it just doesn't work. If you're upset, I'm on this mission, join the club. He never said, he never said that. He barely even implied it. Osha then gives us more expository dialogue. If it comes to it and she doesn't listen to me, you need to stop her. Yes, if it comes to it, we get it. If you can't stop her, they have to stop her. Wh who else is going to stop her? I don't get it. I just don't get it. Please, can we talk about anything more intelligent? May has always been your wound. Maybe so brought you here to face her. Oh my God. May has always been your wound. Maybe soul brought you here to face her. Yeah, we know. We know that's exactly what's happening here. But maybe he brought you here to face yourself. Okay. Hey, you know, Yord, you get a Yord point because that's actually like the first piece of like somewhat intellectual dialogue we've heard in this whole episode. I like that. I like that, Yord. Making things interesting. Let's move forward. We need to catch up. You do need to catch up. And I need to catch up on this goddamn episode stat. We then get a shot of Snape Jr. and May running deep into the Deku tree. That was a Legend of Zelda reference. Anyways, they're going into the forest, and that's all they do in this scene. They just go into the forest. That's the scene. We, we then cut back to the Jedi, and they're wandering around the same forest, but they see these kind of like snail-looking beetle giant bug things on the trees. Tell me in the comments if you know what the lore name is for these. I'm interested to hear any details outside of the actual show. Basil gets a good old whiff of the forest and tells Yord <laughs> that there's something wrong here. I mean, is his nose force sensitive? Are all you guys not able to sense like the darkness of this forest? I don't know. Is this like a super Jedi? I guess like Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend is like the ultimate like apex predator Jedi. I mean, his, his nose has the force. It's crazy. He says there's something wrong here. Something rotten. There's something rotten. Well, are the trees rotting? Because if that's the case, you could see them rotting. I don't know. I don't know how this works. He's OP. He's OP. Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend is OP. I need him as a playable character in the next Battlefront. He could sniff out the campers. Soul then says this. Keep up the pace. Keep down the volume. <laughs> is he talking about the audience? Yeah, guys, put this show on 2x speed and turn the subtitles on. Because uh, honestly, when I rewatch the show, that's what I do. God damn. There's so many meta references in the script on accident that it's just pure comedy. It's like it's like hunting for Easter eggs, but they're shitty, right? So we call them dingleberries. Hunting for dingleberries. Anyways, we move forward through the forest and Osha then touches one of the bugs. Why would you touch this shit? It looks disgusting. It looks vile. And you just have to go and fuck around and find out, don't you? Osha. Where did it go? We don't know. Will it matter to the show? Or is it just something cool and creepy? She looks around and she sees it flying. <laughs> Holy shit. I have it. It went straight for the saber. Nice job, soul. Nice job. We love we love a good soul Jedi chop. Saber chop. 
He then says the most obvious line yet. Let's go. It's going to be dark soon. Yes, that is indeed how the days work. And we move forward. We get more boring shots of them walking through the forest. And Jackie talks to Osha. I was able to sense that creature, but I disturbed it. And now it's dead. She said she disturbed it and now it's dead. Well, yeah, that's all. That's your fault. You you caused it to get scared and attack. And Squid Game chopped it in half. Like, what do you want? It's just, it's a bug. Don't worry about it. It's a goddamn bug. Why are, we, why are we worried about a bug? Jackie then responds with a pretty good bar here. I think she's a, she's a wise young, young Padawan, if I say so myself. We're not defined by what we lose. We're defined by what we survive. I like that. We're defined by what we survive. And I've survived four goddamn episodes of this show, including making the reviews on it. So I think I'm the most Chad Jedi candidate out there, to be honest. You know, come on, give me some slack. Give me some props. I have survived a lot. Thank you, Jackie. We then get some nice music and a shot of the forest. And we cut to May and Professor Snape Jr. Snape talks about how they're almost there, but May seems like she's just not having it. I have to fight a Wookiee after this trek. Yeah, I have to make a review after watching this show. I'd like to rest for a minute as well. So we're going to take a quick moment, guys, and <laughs> for you to like, comment, and subscribe and make me feel better about this because, oh boy, I need it. I'd rather fight a Wookiee. May then goes on to talk about what her master told her about her lessons. It's not a test. What? She says it's not a test. And the final lesson is one you will teach yourself. You will kill a Jedi without a weapon. I mean, that's still a test. How is that not a test? She then goes on to say, how do you kill someone like that unarmed? It goes against everything the Jedi stood for. Well, aren't you going against the Jedi? Why do you suddenly care about their code? And also, they're only unarmed because you disarmed them. So they were armed, but you would be defeating them by disarming them. That's how fighting usually or sometimes works. Even in an honorable fight, somebody else can disarm somebody. It's so contrived. They're trying to all of a sudden put her in the mindset of the Jedi, giving her empathy towards the Jedi out of nowhere for no reason. And the way she's saying it makes no sense at all anyways. It's just, it's it's dumb on one level and then dumber on another level. It's dumb and dumber, but that's a better written movie than this shit. Swear to God, I'd rather watch Dumb and Dumber. Snape Jr. then tells her it's not impossible. You know that. And then May replies with this. I want this more than anything, but it's impossible. You don't even care. I care. How dare you accuse my boy Snape Jr. of not caring? He's been literally following you around, giving you all the help you could need this whole entire show. Ah, you're just a uh, spiteful, ungrateful little witch, May. I just, I swear to God. I'm gonna find you more water. You need to rest. He's even gonna find you more water and let you rest. I'm starting to like Snape Jr. I, I love him. He's a good guy. Snape Jr. then runs off to get her some water because he's a nice guy, but we all know what happens to nice guys. We then cut back to the Jedi, and it appears they're confused and perhaps lost, as one of the Jedis says this about the tracker. I don't see him. What? Basil. Great. What? Yeah, guys, you had one job. Follow Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend, and your entire group, not one of you, could keep track of the little buffoon. The writers are so incompetent at making us believe that the Jedi are this incompetent. I do not understand. Your only mission was to follow this goddamn little rat and you fucked up. It doesn't make any sense. I do not believe it for a second. I only believe that the writers made this happen. I do believe that. I believe that 125,000%. He's vanished again. He's vanished again, just like my interest for the show. I swear we need a tracker just to track our tracker. We need a tracker just to track our tracker. Yeah, Yord, I'm actually kind of... Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of liking your dialogue. You know, I think you're the only one that you're the, you're the only one with signs of life in this show. I swear to God, I thought I was going to hate you because the whole Anakin thing, but uh, I'll let it pass because you're actually a funny guy. We then get more expository dialogue that we already know as Yord says we've lost Basil. We've lost Basil. And they hear some screaming in the distance. It's May. Now, both Snape Jr. and the Jedi can hear her. So this is going to come to a head right here. This is going to be where the big conflict happens in the episode. Snape Jr. runs through the forest, and what happens to nice guys, remember? They finish last. You know, after running through that forest for an extremely long time, I realized something. Osha being alive changes everything. My loyalty is to Osha, not your master. What, what are you doing? Really, May? You're going to switch sides in the middle of this episode for almost no 
reason. I, I, I swear this would have made sense if we had another episode in between, or at least maybe the first half of this episode filled with better dialogue. So running through the forest is what made her change her mind. She just, she was like, you know, the other planets were actually pretty easy to, to get to and to walk through, but this forest shit, I'm really sweating out here, Snape Jr. And uh, I just don't like sweating this much. So screw it, man. You know, my outfit, I'm, I'm wearing a medieval outfit here. I'm sweating balls in the middle of this goddamn Wookiee jungle. I think I'm going to go eat stir fry with the Jedi. She's not having it. She just leaves him there uh, to die or I don't know. We'll see what happens. What I'm going to do is surrender myself to Kelnaka and then turn myself into the Jedi. All of a sudden, she wants to turn herself into the Jedi. Who knows? But yeah, where did this come from? We don't understand. Why did she all of a sudden turn? Doesn't make sense. Because she was sweating in a forest, I guess. And she loves she loves her sister. She loves Osha. I don't know. No, stop. Stop. The Jedi will put you in prison. Not after I tell them who I know. He'll kill you. I'm sorry. May, I know you're written by dumbasses, but can you please, can you please do some intellectual critical thinking here? You are a murderer. It doesn't matter how much information you have. They're still going to put you in jail. You absolute idiot. Anyways, May leaves Snape Jr. hanging by his foot. We cut to a scene with the Jedi investigating further in the forest. And we get this suspicious shot with Sol as he clearly senses something in the force, a disturbance of sorts. What is it? It's nothing. But apparently it's just nothing. Sol and Osha have a conversation about May and how Osha is not ready to confront her yet. But apparently she is now because uh, Sol says this. This is different. I feel different. So apparently, uh, you know, Osha's Jedi battery is now all charged up and she's somehow ready to face May again. Things just happen because characters say they happen. It just, again, nothing makes sense. Sol then drops this bar to Osha. You're not going to face her. You're going to face your past. Well, you're also going to be facing her. I, I do kind of like the sentiment here, and it is kind of somewhat intellectual writing. Some some of the only stuff in the episode that kind of makes me feel a little bit deeper about the show. But still, you're going to be facing her still and your past. I mean, she's part of your past, so it's the same thing. I, I really just, I don't know. It's it's just emotionally contrived bullshit. Then Saul says something very important here, which could be a nice little detail. He says, Both of us will. Once we get May safely to the ship. I'd explain everything. Maybe he's uh, maybe he's not the guy we think he is. Maybe nice guy Squid Game here has something sinister, you know, underneath the surface. Because what could he possibly tell us that would give us a paradigm shift or or change the perspective? This show does have little juicy details hanging here and there to keep us interested, even though none of it makes sense. So that is kind of nice. I do I I do want to see what he says when they finally get back to the ship. I hope it's something important. Probably not, but we'll see. We then cut back to May as she's running through the forest trying to find the Jedi Wookiee Kelnaka. She sees his hut and she makes her way towards it and she trips. I don't know why she trips, but she does. She's being a little hasty. She comes across none other than Rocket Raccoon's boyfriend. He's got this blindfold on. I guess it kind of enhances his uh, force nose smelling powers. Bruh, she's right in front of you. Just come on. Come on. There we go. Obviously, he knows this is not one of their group. This is the... Uh, evil twin sister, so he screams out like he's about to die. Hey, little buddy. And the Jedi hear this and make their way towards May. Yord tells Osha to stay behind them, and they all move forward, but not before May can get inside the Wookiee's hut. She moves through the hut, and she discovers that Jedi Wookiee Kelnaka is indeed actually dead. He's been slashed almost in half with a saber to the chest. Who did this? Well, it clearly couldn't have been one of the Jedi, unless, well, actually, it could have been one of the Jedi. We didn't see all of them on the screen at the same time at all times, but it couldn't have been May. It couldn't have been Osha. It couldn't have been Soul. Could it have been Asian Ezra Miller, Snape Jr.? Probably, likely, unless it's just some off-screen character that has almost nothing to do with this entire plot just for the sake of uh, subverting your expectations. I don't know. It sounds like something they might do, but we don't know who killed this Wookiee. We just, we don't. The Jedi then have May trapped inside the Wookiee Kelnaka's house. And here's where we get Darth Underbite. Smilo Ren himself. And they fly now. They fly now? He literally floats down to the floor like he's goddamn Voldemort. And he moves forward towards Osha. What is that? What is that thing? We don't know. Is it a Sith Lord? 
Is it an edge lord? I don't know. I'm gonna call it Darth Underbite. Yord tells Darth Underbite to stand down. Stand down. As May watches on in horror, she knows this is gonna get dangerous for these Jedi, and she now cares about Osha more than ever. Apparently, Darth Underbite has a staring contest with Osha. She shits her pants and gets swiped to the side like a goddamn iPhone app. The Jedi pull their saber, Watch out! preparing for an epic battle, and. That's the uh, whole goddamn episode. They cut it at the most interesting part because if they give us anything more, we might not come back for next week. And guys, I honestly, I want to recap this episode real quick. So let's do this. We always do this at the end of each, uh, each review. For $23 million, let's tell the story that they told, okay? The Jedi go to the Wookiee planet. May and Snape Jr. go to the Wookiee planet. They find a dead body and get force pushed by Darth Underbite. That's the story. That's $23 million of story right there. $23 million to put Lego pieces on a board, move them together, and do a cool force push scene. Like, that's it? That's $23 million? Leslie, those designer suits better be costing a lot because I want to know where this money went. This episode garners a 2 out of 10 from me, guys. 14% on Rotten Tomatoes is generous. And uh, yeah, so uh, I just, my brain's empty after making this review this recap, this breakdown, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Anyways, guys, like, comment, subscribe. This has been Stark Cinema Acolyte Review, Episode 4. I love you 3000. I'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye now.